Hello, my name is Daniel White, also known as Dansky. I'm a designer and an instructor within Vato Tuts Plus. And this course is all about next level UI design. And if you followed my content for a while, you'll know that I've used Adobe XD quite a lot. And over the last few months, I've started transitioning to Figma. So if you're still in Camp Adobe XD, don't worry, you're not alone. And this course is definitely going to help. So we're going to be starting from a wireframe that you can download in the video description if you'd like to follow along. And we're then going to focus on transforming this into a high quality design with plenty plenty of professional tips and tricks along the way, as well as some animation towards the end. And before we kick off, definitely check out Envato Elements. It's a platform with millions of assets for designers from stock photos to video to textures, brushes, fonts, mockups, templates, music, sound effects, and much more. Like it's an insane amount of stuff for as little as $16.50 a month. And there is a link in the video description if you'd like to find out more. Right, that's the intro done. Let's open up Figma and get started. Right, so I'm in Figma and you can see I've got my wireframe for this homepage design here. This is going to be centered around a fictional AI platform where contributors can upload their own art, their own stock assets, and voluntarily program the AI. And it's going to be called AI Plus. And if we just zoom in a little bit here, you can see we've got our nav bar, we've got some buttons, nice big title, space for a cool graphic. We've got some more descriptive text. We're going to have some icons here that are going to look really cool. We've got some reviews and we're going to use chat GPT to generate those reviews for us. And we've got some recent submissions. So we're going to have some AI art stuff in there as well. And of course, the footer with a few social icons from Envato Elements. So first up, let's start designing. Actually, no, before we start designing, we need to calm down a bit. Let's go and select the home page. And I'm just going to quickly run you through the wireframe. And I'm going to turn on this responsive grid that I've got set up here. So the width of this document is 1440 pixels wide. And you've got the settings here for a 12 column grid. So you can copy those if you'd like to follow along as well. And what this enables me to do is just design everything to fit this responsive grid so that when I'm Having this design displayed on tablet, on mobile, on all different types of devices, I know that everything is going to work responsively. And the great thing about this is you can see that it forces me to line different elements up, which also makes my design more consistent and thus improves the quality. So this is nice and tidy. And everything in Figma you can see snaps to these guides, which makes this process even easier. So you can see here that I'm using a 12 column grid, but if I were designing on eight columns for tablet or four for mobile, for example, it makes it so much easier to design responsively with this grid system. So we've got the vertical grid system, but if I click on the frame again, we've also got a horizontal one set to eight pixels. And I'll just show you this one here. This can be a bit much when you're actually designing because it does make what you see on screen quite complicated. But if I zoom in, you can see we have these horizontal rows all the way down the page. And this basically enables me to snap things in multiples of eight pixels. So we're not going to have any kind of random sizes. Everything's going to be in multiples of eight. And it just, again, adds another layer of polish and consistency, which is going to make the development process easier as well. Um, but also it's just going to make your buttons and those kinds of things more consistent because as you can see, everything snaps to this grid as well. But I'm going to turn that one off because, uh, like I say, it can be a little bit much to kind of keep that on when you're designing. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. In fact, because I've lined everything up beforehand, I'm going to turn off the other grid as well. We're going to focus on the creative stuff. So first of all, let's just whip in a logo. I don't actually have one. And I am using the font Inter for the entire thing. And you'll see that I've added some text. So if your wireframe has Arial or Times New Roman or something like that, that's fine too. I just love this font and I decided very early on that I was going to use it. So we go with AI Plus, extra bold. We're just going to have a really simple logo there. And I'm going to draw a rectangle around this. Let's get rid of that fill. We'll add a stroke. We'll make it white for now. We can play around with some colors in a bit. There we go, something like that. There we go, that looks fine. Let's just round off that corner as well. Oof, a bit too much. 
And again, I'm gonna keep this in multiples of eight or four if I really need to. So we just it just tightens up that consistency a little bit more. Let's go for 12. Rather than me having my radius at 17 and then my uh, spacing for a button at like 13. And I don't know, you can, your spacing and everything can get weird. So having a system like that just makes it much more consistent overall. Right, now let's get to work on those buttons. They're looking pretty bland and pretty boring, so let's select both of them. And we'll make these 12 as well, because consistency. And I think for the login button, no, we'll have the register button. Let's pick a nice bright color for that. We're gonna make that pop off the page. We'll go with a, a this kind of color for now, a nice turquoisey blue cyan, that looks pretty good. And for this one here, I've got some colors that I'm gonna be using, two, 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 three, two, eight. That is the value for this color. And this, if I open the color palette up, you can see it's not completely desaturated dark gray. It's actually got like a hint of blue. And a lot of UIs do use this, and I think it looks really, really nice, just having that kind of subtle hint of blue. Uh, it just adds a bit of life rather than everything just being kind of monochromatic. And let me just show you exactly what I mean. So on the left, I have a completely monochromatic color palette. And then on the right, I have a slight introduction of color. It just kind of gives it a little bit more life and just makes everything look less dull. Right, okay, boom. So we've got login. Now, I'm coming from Adobe XD. And in XD, you create rectangles and you create text and you make a button. In Figma, we don't actually have to do that. What we can do is select the text Let's go and add an arrow here as well. Let's pop that arrow. Actually, no, let's, we could just add an arrow. We could do that. Let's draw a custom arrow. We'll do something a bit different. Arrows are, we've seen arrows before. Let's go and draw, let's draw a line like this. We'll make the weight two, make it white. Okay, that's looking pretty good. And let's round off the cap on this end. And I've got a reference of this little arrow here that I'm going to be referring to. And let's grab the pen tool again. We don't want to continue that, so let's deselect it. And do something like this. Oop. There we go. And let's round off cap for that one as well. Where are my cap settings? <laughs> my cap settings have gone. And you can see this is the disadvantage from coming from Adobe XD. So what I've done is created this as one single shape. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to come out of this shape by pressing escape and I'm going to create this as a second shape because uh, I'm not entirely sure where my caps went. And escape is always a good one to press if you do kind of get stuck. There we go, they're back at the bottom there. So let's go and change those caps on this second shape, both to rounded, there we go. And we want the, the join to be rounded as well. And then let's change the cap type on this to round. There we go. Okay, so they're two separate shapes and that is absolutely fine because we're gonna combine these together anyway. Also a quick tip when it comes to icon design, if you're designing a suite of icons, make sure you keep them consistent in style. So if you're gonna have rounded corners, keep them rounded. If you're gonna have square hard edges, keep them square and hard at the edges. Also maintain a consistent stroke width. So you don't have one that's really thin, and one that's massively chunky, this will look a bit odd. Also, there was something else. Yes, the importance of being creative. So be creative with icon design, but you don't always need to reinvent the wheel. So in this example here, you can see I'm designing an arrow. It's very, very clearly identifiable as an arrow because everyone knows what an arrow is, but I've just added that little break between the two segments to try and interject a little bit of creativity there. So let's go ahead and I think we'll convert this into a component. Here we go, we've just got like a nice custom arrow. It's a bit, just a bit different than all the other arrows you normally see that are just like that. So there we go, nice bit of creativity. 
and we'll select this. I might reuse that. In fact, I will definitely reuse that. So let's go and convert this to a component. And you can see that's listed there. And we'll give this a name. Let's call it custom arrow. You can tell I'm really proud of that custom arrow. And we'll just squidge it a bit closer to the text. And then let's select this text here. I'm going to go auto layout and this will pair these two together. And now what I can do now I've set these as an auto layout group. I can add a fill color to that group. And let's go and pick a nice bright color. Something like this looks fine. And obviously at the moment it's hugging the text and the arrow. It looks awful, but we can increase the padding up here. So let's go and increase that and we can use this to adjust the size of the button. And a great advantage of doing this is it's going to increase that padding on the top and bottom edge and on the left and right edge as well, all automatically. So the spacing is going to be perfect. We're not going to have the left edge thinner and the right edge thicker or anything like that. Also a quick note on spacing because I see a lot of new designers making this mistake. Keep your spacing consistent. If it's the left and the right side, keep them the same. Top and bottom, especially on buttons, keep them the same. Uh, when it comes to spacing as well, don't cram everything together too tightly. Just spread it apart a little bit. Not too much, but just enough that it looks balanced. So uh, that's looking pretty good. I'm going to go for 12. And there you go, you can see we've got this button now all listed in this one object. And that fill is attached to the auto frame group. So it's just a really smart way of designing things like buttons. And what I'm going to do actually now I've made this button is I can actually make this a component and reuse it for the button over here as well. So first of all, let's go and change that color. I think I'm going to go with a different pink. I've got one that I quite like off screen here. So let's add this one. Yeah, much nicer. Let's go with that. And then what I'm going to do is we'll convert this to a component and I'm going to create an instance. Nope, that's Adobe XD. No, this, this functions a bit differently. So you could create an instance actually, but what is better is once you've made that component, go and create a variant. There we go. So we've now got this button and we've got another state here. And this is quite cool if you have a site that's going to have a lot of buttons and things on. So let's go and change the color of this one. And we'll change this back to that darker color. And the great thing about using components and component states is that you can mitigate the chance of design inconsistencies because You've set up those master components. So every other instance of that, well, you know the spacing is going to be perfect because you took the time to get the first one right. So we'll go button one. And you can see with auto layout, it automatically adjusts the layout of that button. And just while we're on the topic of color, it's also worth mentioning something called the 60-30-10 rule. I mean, I say it's a rule, it's, it's more of a guideline and it helps you create a nice balanced color palette. What it is, is 60% is predominantly going to be your primary color. That will make up 60% of your design. 30% is your secondary color. And then you have 10% as an accent color. So in this example, you can see that 10% is that nice punchy pink. 30 is the lighter gray. And then the 60% is the darker gray. It's cut off now, so we will need to just pop that back in the middle. Button two. There we go, let's reposition that like so. And then I can go and move, move this frame elsewhere. And the reason this is really cool is because what I can do now is if I click on this, uh, this frame with the two variants, I can give this a name so we can call this buttons and then we've got default one and default two. So let's go and call this button. No, 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 buttons. There we go. The values we enter down here. So we've got button one, which I think is that top one and then button two. And then what I can do is I can actually, if I switch over to my assets, toggle down home page, I got the buttons there. So I could drop a button, but then I can actually switch between these two states. 
So if I'm using a button across an entire website with loads of pages, I can just pick between these two button styles. And if I then go and type, you can see the button gets longer. So let's go and call this register. And then this one, well, I want that other button style. And we'll call this log in. And we've got this here that we can, we can just move that out the way somewhere. We'll put it out the way for now. And we have our two buttons. Let's line everything up. Something else that's also worth mentioning is that you may have noticed I'm using the font inter throughout the entire document, even on the buttons. So whereas you can use two or three different typefaces in your UI design, you can also use one. If it has a bunch of different weights and styles, use that one font and uh, yeah, it gives you plenty of variation. And we could go ahead and group all of our components and variants on a separate artboard, artboard, <laughs> separate frame. Uh, or put them somewhere else. But I think we'll just leave them there for now. That is fine. And then we'll go something like this and let's get that spacing in there. We'll go for 16 between them both. And then we'll line them up and snap it to that edge there. So we've set the buttons up, we've added some colors, but we've done it in a way that is smart. The navbar text here is inter again, medium 16 point. Now we could go and set all of these different text elements up as text styles. So we could go here and add this as a text style and do it that way. But to be honest, I don't really worry about this too much earlier on in the process. I want to keep everything kind of loose and creative, let those ideas flow freely. When it comes to like creating the other 30 pages. Yes, you absolutely need to set up your text styles, your buttons, your components, have everything done because once you've done 30 pages, if you want to then make a change, uh, you don't want to make it across every single page. You want to be able to update the font size or the font style or the color or something like that and have it automatically just propagate to every other page. It will save you a ton of time, trust me. Right, I think what I'm going to do here is I definitely want to kind of get the whole left right thing going on. This just makes it a bit more interesting as we're going down the page. So we'll put that there. We've got these three in a row here. These will have some lovely glass effect icons. I'm going to try and stagger these maybe. So as you're kind of going down the page, it's almost leading the viewer down the page. And we'll keep this on the right hand side. And it fills this space up here quite nicely as well. So we've still got plenty of breathing space and spacing around everything, which is important, but we're just kind of trying to fill that space a little bit more efficiently. Right, that looks pretty good. Let's go and let's try adding another rectangle. I think what I might do is we'll add one over here and let's send this backwards. Something behind, let's try and make that a nice light gray. This could be like a background element. We could use this to add a little bit of visual interest just to make it a bit more interesting. A lot of websites nowadays, they do look very similar. So I think we have to be really creative with our design. And actually it goes beyond just being creative for the sake of it. It's about intelligently designing something that is going to lead your viewer down the page. A bit later on in the course, you'll see how I use angles for some of the sections to lead the viewer down the page. It just creates a nice flow, a nice rhythm to the page. And it's something that if you can integrate it into your design, it's really gonna take it to the next level. So what I could do is double click this and select this top left point, hold shift and go with the arrow keys, go one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mm, one, two, three, four, five. So 15 nudges up, which is 150 pixels and do the same with the bottom. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, you can see I'm moving the top one as well. Let's undo that. Make sure that is deselected. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And let's come out of that. And I'm going to drag this to the middle just so it lines up. You know, it, I could line it up with somewhere random, but I'm a stickler for the details, so I kind of want to line this up here. 
there we go that looks pretty cool and what I can actually do is round off the corners of this shape as well and you can see there I'm rounding off all of the corners but I can of course double click on a particular corner and we'll set that to zero and then we'll click this one we'll set that back to zero and then if I select both of these corners let's set those to let's make them nice and big we'll go for 160 that looks fine and I think at the top maybe we'll do something similar and have an image in there as well so could we just reuse this yeah we could probably reuse this just holding alt or option and dragging i can press shift h to flip that horizontally and then we can just snap that all the way in the top right corner using these alignment options here snapping again just adds another layer of precision to your work and just makes it in short better better more consistent more polished and ultimately more professional I've got that same angle here. I'm going to select both of these bottom points and move them up. And I'm going to use this as a mask and actually put an image in here as well. Also, when using elements that have these custom angles, try reusing those elements where you can, copying them, rotating them, flipping them, because if you're creating them from scratch every single time, you increase the chance that there's going to be those inconsistencies. Maybe the angles will be different on two objects that are similar. When you're reusing those elements, you're going to mitigate those inconsistencies. Oop, I've moved those top ones up as well. Let's bring those back down. Let's try and bring them both down. Oh no, it's moving everything now. <laughs> okay. All right, you win. We'll do it one at a time. There we go. Boom. And I've just got to make sure I select this corner here and we'll set that all the way back to zero. Boom. So we've created a couple of elements here. And a nice little detail is because we've reused that asset, we've got a consistent angle here. You can see the spacing between these two shapes is perfectly consistent and that kind of detail is very important right what else are we going to do let's go and let's go around these corners as well i think we're going to go for the whole rounded corner look let's go for well i said we were going to do multiples of eight or four so let's go for 48 <laughs> okay right i know there's going to be some icons there so i'm just going to get rid of these now I don't need to see that. And I think with this text here, I'm actually going to have the number of the step above it because it's going to be a three step process. Upload, you can just relax and chill, and then you can earn revenue. So rather than doing all three of these manually like this, let's just do one and then we can copy and paste that as a component. Because then if I do make changes, I'm kind of, I'm not only designing smarter that way and more efficiently but it just makes my design more consistent as well. And you can see on these cards, I've centrally aligned the text. I do love a bit of central alignment personally. However, if I did have more text, I would have to shift that to a left alignment just because it makes it much easier for a user to scan the text and kind of track that left edge when everything is lined up. Otherwise, if it's all central and you've got lots of, let's say you've got lots of paragraph text that is all centrally aligned, when the user gets to the end of a line, they have to then go and find the start of the next line. And because the text is centrally aligned, that start point will keep shifting around. So it makes it much harder for someone just to kind of read it quickly or scan it with their eyes. So let's go and grab that pink color. In fact, what I could actually do is if I select the pink and then go down to, or is it here we go, we've got the color here. I can actually, with this selected, click this icon here and add this as a style. I can give it a name, but if I just create style, you can see it just adds it with this name. I'm going to be reusing that pink quite a lot, so uh, we'll just kind of keep that there. I've got my color styles here. I can actually go in and change that. Let's go and change it now. And you can see, oh no. Oh, I thought that was going to update. <laughs> that obviously behaves a little bit differently. 
And I figured out the mistake I made here. This works slightly differently in Adobe XD versus Figma. In Figma, if I create this new color style, I need to go and apply that to a bunch of objects, the new color style that I've just created. Then when I go and change it, it will update that color from the color styles panel. Whereas in Adobe XD, if I add a color to my color library, what it will do is it will scan the document for every instance of that color already there, and it will pull that into that color style automatically. That is the difference. Figma doesn't do that, and uh, that is why I got confused. Anyway, let's delete this color style for now because we're not going to go too much into that today. Right, let's go and pick that lovely pink color again, FF326F. There we go. And what I'm going to do is make this a bit lighter. And we'll make this a bit bigger. We'll go for 48 on the size. Move this up. And let's go and add a color here for the text. We'll go 6E72812. And of course, that's very light, but I've got my color here that I'm going to use for a lot of these different UI elements 313237. And again, these colors are just. They're very similar to the light gray, the medium gray, and the dark gray, but they've just got that hint of blue in them, which I think looks a little bit nicer. Right, let's go and check the color on that one there. We've got 2238. Right, let's drag another instance of this button out. There we go. Register. Cool. OK. So now what I'm going to do is select all of these different elements and we'll make this a component. And then I can just copy this over. You can see it snaps in place. Delete what's already here and then paste this in. So what have we got? We've got relax two. And then we'll create another copy. And then we're going to call this one number three. And this is going to be earn. So as I said, this is just it's a much more efficient way of working because if I want to go and change anything like this or move this around, adjust the spacing, I can do that all from here. But also it just means that my design will inevitably be more consistent. Right, let's move this down a pinch now. Just so it doesn't collide with that previous section. We could actually move that one up. There we go, looking good. Now I'm actually going to copy this same properties here. So let's go and select this color. And then we'll go here and paste that in. Get rid of the white. Let's make sure we're at 100% opacity as well. And then what's the radius on these? We've got 48. So let's go with that. Boom, nice and consistent. Now for the stars, I'm going to do something a little bit different. We're just going to add a rectangle or a square, I should say. We've got the same pink listed in our document color. So that's probably a bit easier to work with for now. And then if we go to layers, got to make sure that that is underneath all of the stars. There we go. And then let's go and set this star as a component. There we go. And now I can set this as a variation as well. So depending on the rating, I have something like this. Let's go and introduce a little bit of that blueiness. This is a new color here. So there we go. Again, I can plonk this on the outside of the document once I'm finished. Let's just create an instance of this here, and then I can choose which rating I would like that to be. And we can, of course, give this a name, and we can go and name all of the different states as well. So let's just remove this. We'll duplicate this out. Eight pixels apart, nice and consistent. Command or Control D will repeat that last action. And let's just change that last one there to the second variant. And we've got a four out of five star rating. 
and we can now plonk this over here. That's fine. And then if I wanted to go and make, let's say the box a bit smaller, I can go and select it with Command or Control D and clicking. Let's make it a little bit smaller. We'll go for 28 by 28 on both of those. And you'll see it becomes a bit smaller. And it's a good idea to adjust that spacing now as well. So let's just make that nice and consistent. Fantastic. And we've also got that other bit of subtext, which I believe was 6E7. Where was that other color? There we go. And we've got, ooh, what should we do with this top text here? Let's, no, I think that's fine. We'll, we'll keep that white. Do we go for medium or let's go for semi? No, let's go for bold. Let's go for bold. There we go. And we've got Bob from Bobsville. Let's move that spacing up. And then make sure that this spacing here, top and bottom, is nice and consistent. In fact, what we can do is we could do exactly what we did before. Select all of this and go Auto Layout. And you'll see it does that, which isn't ideal actually because it will put it into a vertical or horizontal state. We, we can adjust the alignment, but it's not really working. So what I'm going to do in this instance, if I undo that a second, is let's try making this an auto layout group first of its own. Again, we can go vertical or horizontal, but that's just fine. Now we've made that one an auto layout group itself. Let's try that again. That could be the one. We've got the spacing here. It's set to go vertical. There we go. So that spacing there is set to 16 pixels. And you can see it's highlighted in pink. So it's going to keep that spacing consistent, which again keeps the design more consistent as well as saves you a ton of time. Let's check it works by just adding in some text. And it should just extend all the way down, which it does. The only thing that might cause a problem, let's see, can I add a fill to the entire thing? Yes. Yes, we can. Thank goodness for that. Let's grab that darker color that I can't find anymore. Where's it gone? 313237. There we go. Boom. And we can increase the padding. Let's go for something like 40. Bit more padding. And of course, you can turn on those um, responsive grids and guides and things and line everything up spacing wise like that. So let's just knock this down a couple. And you can see for the reviews, I'm currently using just placeholder lorem ipsum copy. However, in a minute, we will be using chat GPT to try and generate us some reviews that are just a, a bit more realistic and a bit more representative of how the final design will actually look. And now I've set this up in a really smart way. So no matter what text I put in there, the design, the spacing, everything is going to be really, really tight, which is perfect. So let's get rid of all of these. Let's turn that guide guides back on. We should be able to duplicate, not the whole thing, not the whole thing. Select and duplicate this a couple of times. Are you lined up? No, let's shuffle you in. Just make sure you're lined up as well. Excellent. And then I think we'll do this row by row. So we've got the first one. Let's go and switch over to chat GPT and <laughs> let's try something fun. Okay, right. Um, write me six product reviews for a platform called AI plus in inverted commas. The reviews should be between 30 and 60 words in length. And each review should have the name of the person and their 
country location. Okay, let's see what we get back. There we go. Thank you, Sarah Johnson from the US. So we've got um, we've got some copy now, and that's a really quick and easy way to actually get some more authentic copy rather than everything being lorem ipsum. So let's just take a second to go and copy and paste this in. And because we've taken the time to set this all up correctly, what have we got? Sarah Johnson from the United States. Oh, let's let's go first name only. Keep it nice and informal from the United States. And then if I pick, well, they're all pretty much the same length, but even if there was one that was longer like this, you can see the entire thing just kind of extends down. Right. So let's go and paste all of these reviews in. Okay, that's the first row done. Oh, let, I'm feeling bad. Let's let's throw a few couple of five stars in there. And let's get the the five star ones there at the top. There we go. Boom. And you can see they're slightly different lengths. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to just intentionally make these different lengths. So you can kind of really see how this design could potentially look. So let's duplicate that down. We'll keep that same 32 pixel spacing. One, two, three, one, two. So I'm just using the arrow keys holding shift to move that with a bit more precision. And then we've got some more. Let's add these in now. And then what I could actually do is I could go and uh, let's take this first line of text and we'll just pop that in. Now to paste this in with the same style, let's go to edit and paste over selection. And you could go through and just literally take the first bit of text or something. I'm just going to quickly paste this in on all of them. <laughs> They've all got the same title. And one thing that I should have done, but I didn't, and you'll see why, is I should have set this up as a component beforehand so I can control the styling because if I go and change this here by clicking the the shape itself and if I change the radius to let's go for 48 again you can see it only changes that one whereas if I set this up as a component I could change the radius and it would update on all of them so that's definitely something to keep in mind so now I've got to go through and manually change all of them because it's only one page, it's really not the end of the world. We're just focusing on the design stuff. But if I had to do that across an entire website, 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 that would be a problem. So uh, it's definitely worth making sure that you've got that stuff set up beforehand. Now, I'd like a bit more spacing on the top specifically. So again, I'm really wishing I should I set that up as a component now, <laughs> but I didn't. So I've got to move on. So we can just do that there. We'll set that to 62. I think it's looking pretty good. And I might be able to select all of these. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, it's not too bad. I can select all of them and do it in bulk. And I've just got to get that spacing back to 32. Because 32 is the width between the different elements as well. Okay, what people say about us. So we have some reviews in there and a few different ratings and a way to change those ratings really efficiently as well. I think we're gonna have to move the submission section down a bit. We are running out of space. And let's perhaps move these up. We'll scooch that text up there a bit as well. Oh my goodness, we're running out of space. Okay, let's try it with the text overlapping this shape. This could look kind of cool. Or I could just go and move this random shape that I've created up a bit. Something like that. Oh, I think we'll move it up for now. We'll see how that looks. There we go. Right, let's get some images in there. I think uh, we need some images. What I'm going to do is just drag this out holding Alt or Option because I'm going to use this shape as a mask and I have a hero image 
over here. So let's go to place. And we've got this cool AI 3D character thing. I'm going to click here to place it. You can see it's massive. So let's scale that down. No, not the shape as well. <laughs> Make sure you select just the image, scale it down. And I think we're going to rotate this fella so he matches the same kind of angle. So let's try and line that angle up so it's consistent. Again, just more detail, which will give a much higher quality design. And a quick side note, the importance of that hero image at the top of the page cannot be understated. Um, that is one of the first things that a user will see. Make sure it is high quality. Make sure it is appropriate for the brand and that it does a good job of selling the product or service. Um, it will make a, uh, a massive difference. So let's pop that there. Now, Figma is a bit different to Adobe XD. Your mask should be behind rather than on top or the shape that you're going to be using rather. So let's select them both and add the mask here. And now I should be able to shuffle him back. And again, let's line that up. There we go. OK, so we've got him cropped there. He is covering the buttons, which uh, that is going to be an issue. I think I'm just going to have to extend the length of my page a bit and give myself more space to work with. And let's turn off those guides now. They are, they're a bit distracting. Right, okay. We need to select these elements, those elements. Let's move those down. Let's move these down as well. Move this down and then we should be able to move all of this down enough that it isn't colliding with the buttons because that will be a problem. And of course, I've got to extend this backdrop down as well. And let's zoom in nice and close. Yep, all good, brilliant. And something I'm going to do in a minute is add a gradient to this hero image. And gradients are a great way to make your UI designs look so much more beautiful. Everything doesn't have to be solid colors. Sometimes solid colors work. But um, yeah, just consider the use of gradients because uh, Whew, I love me a good gradient. And then I can select the background and let's go and sample that pink color. But I think for this top one, solid pink is fine, but I can't see the button now and we can make this more interesting. So let's copy this color and we'll go and change the, the type of gradient to a linear one. And I think we'll set the color on the other end to the same color, but no, we don't want to play around with opacity. Let's make it a lighter color. If we start playing around with opacity, we're going to get that gray from the background coming through and it's it's not going to look very nice. So let's get a nice light color here. And I think we'll have the gradient going from the bottom left to the top right. And you can see our button once again does stand out. So something like this looks pretty cool. Yeah, I think that gradient just looks a bit more interesting as well than a solid color. So I'm, I'm happy with that. That looks cool. Also, let's change the background color. The background color is still gray. Let's get at least something in there. We could just make it darker, but I've already got a color which is very similar, but it has that slight blue hue to it. So there we go. And I think for this one as well, I'm going to try something similar with the the whole gradient thing. I really like that. Let's try that. So we'll go and add a linear gradient. We'll go and paste in that kind of lighter gray color. Now here we can use opacity. We don't need to pick a different gray. We can just blend the same color to zero or 10. We could go for zero, I suppose. It would just completely fade out. Let's go for 10. There we go. So it goes from like a really prominent version of that gray to a much fainter version of that gray. And even though we're using, I think, pretty much the same color as this, actually, when you've got that gradient, these boxes still stand out. And it just makes it look a bit more interesting. Although the text has disappeared here. So we're going to need to bring that color back, which is 6E7281. These are the colors that I've picked beforehand. I absolutely love them. 
and same again here. 6E7281, boom, there we go. Again, we've got some more arrows. We could use the same arrows from the button, but I think I I think I'll keep them like this, much more traditional for this bit. And let's add a white stroke, two for the thickness, and round off by 12, which is the same radius as the box. And of course, let's make sure it's the same width and height. We'll go for 48. And let's move this here. And we can make that a component as well. And let's flip that. So we can actually flip that component. And then if I go in and change this, it will still adjust it. It's just taking into account that flip as well. So now we have some controls. We have the ability for people to scroll through the recent submissions. And actually, I'm going to put this text over here. There's quite a nice bit of space here. Um, it fits a little bit better. Yeah, let's do that. I'll do that. We'll move the buttons down just so they line up with this text on the left. So we're just keeping everything nice and aligned. Make sure I don't go outside of the guides here. So another little detail, we're just going to make sure all of this lines up as well. There we go. And let's get that spacing tight as well. So we'll go for 16 on the spacing. And once I finish the design, I would turn back on the horizontal guides and I would kind of tidy everything up just so the spacing is super tight. But we're not quite there yet. We're still having fun. We're still playing. So let's round these off as well. We'll go with 48 because we're being consistent. And I think it's time to get some images in. Let's go and place some stuff. What have we got here? We've got a, a really cool cat in a jacket. I love this. And what I'm going to do is rather than click over here, I'm going to click on this shape and it will add the image directly into the graphic. So let's add a few more. Okay, there we go, some images. That looks a little bit better now. Now down here, I'm gonna to need to add something for the username. So I'm just gonna grab this, this box here. We'll duplicate that one over. And we'll go with that same color. What is it? Six, E, seven, two, eight, one. Nope, that's the slightly lighter one. Three, one, three, two, three, seven. And let's round off those corners. We'll go with 12 again. And we'll keep this nice and tight. And again, you can see I'm defaulting back to how I used to work in Adobe XD. We don't need to do this at all. This is one thing that's going to take some getting used to in Figma. Select the text. And then uh, what are we doing? Just. Oh, no, there's no auto layout. OK, so you only get auto layout if there are multiple objects, but we can add a fill. Could I add this as a fill behind it? No, it adds it to the text. Interesting. Okay, I wonder if there is a way to add a fill. I've got an idea. What we'll do is we'll we'll make this a component. There we go. Now we've got we've got our auto layout and now I should be able to add a color. There we go. Okay. Boom. So I can add that bit of padding on the side. And that's the kind of that's the smart way to do it anyway, because you know, now um, this is what I should have done with the reviews, really. If I did want to go and change that radius, it just it updates across all of them. So there we go. We've got our kind of username set up there. And then we can go and add this to some other bits of artwork as well. 
And the way this carousel is designed to work is that as you scroll through the images, the kind of one in focus appears here and is much bigger. And then as you scroll through, um, the next image gets bigger as well. And we're going to be animating that later in the course as well, just to just to make it look a bit more visually appealing. And let's go and add some usernames just while we're here. We'll go at, I don't know, cat bandit. We'll go with that. Um, at sunny houses. <laughs> and then what do we have here? Um, I love properties. Yeah, sure. That works. We'll go with that. And I'm also going to be using some vector social icons that I've downloaded from Envato Elements. Um, I love these. I think they're really cool. They've got your Facebooks, your Twitters, Instagrams. They're all very recognizable, but they're just slightly different. And they do have a design style that is consistent throughout. And it just uh, it makes things a bit more interesting. So we're going to use that same kind of medium gray color, I'm going to call it. We've got the social platform here. And now it's time to go to Adobe Illustrator. I've grabbed these from Envato Elements. There's some really nice stylized icons. So we've got a Facebook one. Let's pop that in there. We've got Twitter, which is over there. We've got Instagram, which is back here. And we've also got YouTube, which for some reason, I think the shape <laughs> it just makes it look really small. So I'm going to be cheeky and just scale it up a pinch just because I, I I can't. It has to be like a similar size. And what I'm going to do, let's go and change all of these. So we'll command click to go inside these and that will enable us to select the color. That's command or control. And what that does is it just automatically clicks inside the frame or the group rather than having to ungroup different elements. Now they're way too big, so we're gonna to need to shrink those down. Let's do that. And then let's take a second to go and pop them in their respective place. Okay, now I need to copy those same properties. So I've got the eyedropper tool here, which is I on the keyboard. And then let's select these and round off those corners. And because I would reuse those social icons across multiple pages, first off, let's put them all in the center. There we go. Shifty shift, try and make the, the space either side consistent. Cool. And then what I'm going to do is make all of those components. And I could go and give this a name here. We'll call this Facebook. We'll go Instagram. We've got Twitter. And then, of course, YouTube. And then we can group all of these together and then just make sure they are central on the page. Boom, fantastic. That's that's all there is to the footer. You know, this text is just intermedium. It doesn't need to be anything wild. Um, it's pretty simple, but I'm happy with that. That looks um, that looks fine. Go up here. Da, da, da. This is all looking really good. So I think pretty much actually. Oh, let's let's add a little bit. Let's add that same color to the border. This isn't like a logo or by any means, but. Um, we can try and make it look a bit like a logo, sort of. There we go. There we go. That could be a logo. And of course, let's make sure it's lined up to the, the edge. Now, if I turn on the guides, you can see this text isn't lined up to the edge because the bounding box of the text is a little bit bigger. So if you really want to, you can just manually shuffle it into position. If you're a real stickler for that kind of detail. But if we just zoom out a second, I think it's looking pretty good. You know, we've got quite a lot done. It's clean. We've got a nice consistent color palette. We've got lots of different kind of, I want to say grays, but they're kind of with a hint of blue 
Also, something else I want to mention quickly is the rhythm of a page design or sometimes the lack thereof. Oftentimes, a lot of people think you have to just get everything up the top of the page above the fold. Uh, in today's day and age, that's just not the case anymore. You can have a very, very long page and the rhythm of your page, how you kind of repeat elements, arrange them, how you design the page and lay everything out will lead your viewer down the page and get them from the top to the bottom. The rhythm, I think, is much more important rather than just simply talking about getting content above the fold or the overall length of a page. Because you can have a long page, but if it's got a bad rhythm, people are going to drop off and bounce. If it's got a good rhythm and it's well designed, you're going to be able to cleverly lead them down the page to the bottom. Yeah, we've set up most of the design in a smart way that's going to make it more efficient, but also more importantly, more consistent. And now we're going to design some really nice glass icons and we're going to be using gradients to simulate the highlights and the shadows in the design. We're also going to be using background blur as well. So there's a few different techniques we're going to be using to try and not make them look really 3D, but just make them look a little bit more realistic and add a bit of depth to them as well. So let's go and do some uh, some really nice glass styled icons. These. I, I love these. I really do love this. I know I'm a bit biased saying that about my own work, but I, I'm i pretty chuffed with these ones. They turned out really cool. So let's go for 24 on the radius. Upload. Ah, right. First of all, I don't want to make this inside the component, so let's just make sure I'm making this on top. And I'm going to duplicate this and rotate it. And let's sample that same pink color. And then we'll copy this over. Shift H to flip it horizontally. So this is just going to represent uploading your graphics, your artwork. And then I need an arrow. So we could draw one, but for more consistency, I'm going to use Figma's tool. So we've got the polygon tool, the rectangle tool, it makes it very easy to snap these together. And you can see I'm drawing inside the component again. So let's just go and create this out of the way because I keep jumping into the component by mistake. All right, let's go and squish this down. There we go, that's a nice arrow shape. We can combine those into a single shape here with union selection. And we could even round off the corners if we wanted, but I think, I think that looks a bit weird. So we'll keep a nice, a nice hard, crispy edge to the arrow. And it really does want to drag it inside that component, doesn't it? So uh, I think we're just going to have to go and we're going to have to go and play out here with our design. And let's make this white. And I think for the cards, what we're going to do is we're going to create this really nice glass effect. So for the fill, we're going to go linear. We're going to go with white for both ends. But what we're going to do is we're going to make one of these 100%. And the other one we're going to bring down to, let's go for 10. We'll see how that looks. So we'll start with 100. And then make sure that it's up. I want the light source coming from here. So we're going to have a consistency to these icons, which I think is important. So let's just nudge that one out. We'll play around with the gradient a bit more. And let's bring you down. Yeah, maybe 50. 50 on that end, and we'll go 10 on the other end. And then what I'm going to do is I can copy this gradient with Command or Control C, add a new stroke, and then paste that one in, and we'll just get rid of the other one. And then, oh, that's a bit thick. Let's go for, we'll go for two. And this is a nice way to add like a nice little highlight around the edge. And we can actually go and change the values of this as well. So I could make this could make this even more pronounced, but then bring it down on the other end. So you can see it almost fades out to nothing and then bring that up. So it kind of by moving this up, it's really just adding a highlight just to that top edge. So we're kind of imagining this fictional light source. And if I go back to the fill, we're just illuminating that top edge again, and we'll bring that one up. There we go. That looks uh, that looks pretty nice.
Just maybe a few more tweaks. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. And the great thing about that is we can reuse it. So let's go and copy the fill. We'll paste it here. And then we can select the stroke. We'll copy that and we'll paste this as well. And you can see because this one's flipped, the light is coming from over there. So I will need to go and change the direction just so my icons are consistent with their style. And for some reason, it doesn't copy the stroke weight either, so we're going to thicken that one up. So that's only really applicable to this because I did flip these objects around. But then let's move them in. And for this one, actually, I'm going to add the stroke to this one as well. Make that two. In fact, we could even add that same gradient. So you can see this is a really quick and easy way to just copy and reuse some of the styles that we've been creating. So we're going to have that coming from the top right to mimic the light source. There we go. That's looking pretty cool. We can move the arrow up, maybe squidge it down a pinch. I'm keeping everything central here so we're nice and consistent. Let's maybe move these, move these in a little bit like this. I'm going to bring that radius down a bit. I think the radius consistency on here, it doesn't matter if I kind of change this to the other UI elements because this, this is like a graphic, you know, this, you'd expect this to perhaps be a bit different. But yeah, that's looking pretty cool, I think. Okay. The only other thing I'm going to add is a drop shadow. And I'm going to offset this on the X. So this is going to, again, mimic that light source. We're just being really consistent with what we're doing. So the shadow, the light's coming from the top right and the shadow is being cast in the bottom left. Let's make it nice and soft. Soft shadows always look lovely. 25% opacity. We'll go for 15. We'll keep it nice and subtle. And now I can copy that drop shadow and you guessed it, paste it onto these elements as well. Okay, that's uh, that's one done. We'll leave it out there for now, but we will bring it back in. And something else I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this from Adobe Illustrator. This doesn't look like anything yet, but it will be a yin yang symbol, which is going to be representative of relaxing. And you can create this in Figma, but I thought I would show you this in Illustrator something that I use all the time for a lot of my graphics. So I've just got a bunch of circles. I'm going to use the Shape Builder tool and we're going to combine these together. Hold Alt or Option and then click in these spaces to kind of punch out a hole from those shapes. Now I've got these shapes. I can swap the fill and the stroke. Let's make one a different color just so we can see. There we go. Super quick way to create the yin yang symbol. And rather than copy this as one thing, I'm going to copy and paste each one individually. And as you can see, I will need to, I'll need to put these back together manually. No, not like that. It wants to like merge them into one shape. Don't do that. Okay, there we go. We've put it back together. And uh, it's way too big. Let's scale it down holding shift. And that keeps everything nicely together. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this lovely glass effect that I've just made, and you can tell I'm clearly very proud of. And let's go and put it on this one. Ah, right, you can see what I've done there. Mistake. I have clicked on this and it's applied that to the frame. So what we need to do is if you're bringing in graphics from Illustrator, make sure you press Command or Control and click, and then click on the actual vector itself. Otherwise, it will um, kind of paste it as a frame. So there we go. We've got that. We've got the stroke that we created. So let's go and apply that as well. 
set that to 2 for the weight. And we don't want to forget the drop shadow either. So we'll select that, paste it in there. Cool, pretty good. And we're going to do exactly the same for the pink. This lovely gradient, let's go and apply that one to the bottom. Again, I pasted it on the frame. Oh, that's the habit I'm going to have to try and get out of. And let's grab that lovely highlight. Where are you hiding? There you are. And then we'll paste that here for the stroke. We don't need these default black ones. We can get rid of that. Let's make it two. There we go, nice. And we've got that highlight at the top, which looks pretty good. Just a drop shadow, really. So let's add that there, paste, and it's added it. Oh, did I do that already? Yeah, I did that already. This one, there we go. And you can see I've done it again. <laughs> I've pasted it again on the frame. Oh my goodness. That's going to be a tough habit to break, I think. Okay, let's undo that. Paste that on the shape itself. Hmm, that's a tricky one, that is. Okay. Ah, right. We've got, that's that's probably one way around it then. What was happening was it was the frame was constricting the shadow and it was like cutting it off. So what I did was I uh, went cut with Command or Control X, jumped outside of that frame, that, that group, and then pasted it on its own. And I think that's going to be the way to do it is Command or Control click, cut, and then paste. But outside of that group. There we go, like that. And then it isn't constrained. And yeah, that looks pretty cool. And we're not the shadow isn't constrained anymore. There we go. We have a really cool uh, cool symbol. I like that. So let's start popping these in position. I'm gonna have these coming just out the box. I think that looks pretty cool. Maybe we'll scale it up a pinch. And let's drag this one here as well. Oh no, I'm dragging it in, in again. Don't do that. Let's use the arrow keys. We'll just move it that way, it's safer. We'll make it a bit bigger. Yeah, that looks pretty cool. And what we could even do actually is select this one here and we could add a background blur effect. Now to do this, I will need to drop the opacity of the gradient. So the color will kind of become kind of muted, but you'll be able to see underneath. So it will just kind of sell that glass effect a little bit more. So we could drop the blur down to five. Five's a bit low, maybe eight. So you can see the cards behind. Um, which just gives the whole thing a bit more depth. So we've considered lighting, shadows, and even blur and depth of field in our icons. And I think it just makes them look a bit better. This drop shadow looks really diff. Oh yeah, because I cranked it up, didn't I? 15, there we go. We've got that nice, subtle, soft shadow. Right, one more icon. Um, if I'm honest, this one is my favorite. This is going to be a wallet icon. And actually we do need these uh, these cards, this one here. So let's set the rotation to zero and then hold shift and rotate 90 degrees. I'm going to need to adjust this lighting. So let's move these. We want one up there, one down here. And we'll do the same for the stroke. One up there, one down there. Yep, looking good. Very nice. And then I'm going to duplicate this with Command or Control D and shrink it down. This is going to be like the little bit on the end of the wallet. Um, but of course, we can see the wallet underneath, which uh, looks a bit weird. So what we're going to do is we're going to add, you guessed it, a background blur. 
And using background blur in this way not only makes the icon look a bit more interesting and is arguably kind of cool, but it just helps it feel like it has a bit more depth as well. And you can tweak the blur, but it just makes this look a bit more like it sits on top. But you can still just about see the definition of that edge underneath, which I think looks really cool. And we could go and change the radius here. I don't know whether I should keep them the same or not. I'm not sure. What do you think? Maybe 12. Do I have to make this 12 as well? No, I like 16. I'm going to be cheeky and make them a little bit different. All the designers are going to tell me off now. Right. Ellipse. Let's add that there. Little button for the wallet. Okay, that's looking pretty cool. We've got those shadows on there as well, which have been copied from the other icons we've done. And now I'm going to grab this one here and we're going to use this to make a card. So we're going to have this at an angle. Actually, first I'm going to add a bit more detail to the card. So I am going to add something here and just round off these corners. Oh, this is a really cool trick that I learned as well. So to kind of get the consistent radius all the way around, let's make an ellipse and just make it like, I don't know, we'll go with bright yellow. Drop the opacity to 50% just so you can see. The way you do it is you kind of get the circle to match this corner and then scale it up from that corner until it hits the edge here. Let's just move that in position. There we go. So you can see here, so we start there, scale up. As soon as you bump, you bump the shape, this is what your radius needs to be. So you can then adjust the radius value. And then more or less, give or take, there's a 0.1 of a pixel in there. But then you make the radius of your outer shape match that circle, and then you've got a consistent um, width all the way around, which is a nifty little trick. Right, let's just sample a light color here and make it maybe a pinch lighter. White, but not quite. And then we'll change that lighting. I've got to reposition that so it's coming from up there. And we'll do the same for the stroke as well. So you are going up there. Nice little highlight. And you can see I can, it's so responsive and smooth and I can really adjust how far I'd like that highlight to come down. I think we should probably squish this down a bit, a bit more credit cardy shape. Yeah, I think that looks good. And now I'm going to scale it down and the radius is all going to completely change. <laughs> oh no. Okay, well let's scale it down anyway. I should have got the sizing correct first. We'll rotate that, Do pop it there. And then what I'm going to do is bring all of these on top. And now we're going to apply the background blur to this shape. So let's go and add that in. I think it's remembered the same settings as before, 10, which is fine. We could match the settings from the other shape, but this looks good. And then I could just move this around, depending on how much of the card I would like poking out. And I'm going to change that corner radius as well. So essentially this person has a glass wallet, if that's a if that's a thing. And again, you can use that nifty little trick to uh, get the, the width around the edge consistent. I'm just going to eyeball it for now and actually make that a pinch smaller. But that looks fine to me. And let's set this back to 100% because I don't want this to be 80% because there's nothing underneath it that is showing through. So. I don't need to drop the opacity or anything. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So we've got a card and a wallet. And I can now group these together as well. And maybe scale that up a little bit. In fact, let's group all of these different icons together. Just so selecting them, moving them and scaling them becomes much, much easier. And they're all kind of poking out the top as well, which is a nice kind of a nice little stylistic choice there as well. 
In fact, I could even go and make the numbers a bit bigger. Let's go and bump those up, boop, like this. And then you can see the advantage of components as well. As I say, it saves you time, makes your workflow quicker, but it also makes your design more consistent because the spacing across all three of these cards is exactly the same. And there we go, I think we're pretty much done. We've got the navbar at the top with the buttons. We've got the text here. Oh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna add a little splash of pink here. This is something that I just love doing. I love this look where you just change the color of the full stop. We're gonna add that there. We've got some descriptive text here. Let's just check the, move that down to fill that spacing a bit more. No, I think we'll leave that as it was, that's fine. We've got the process here. We could again use ChatGPT or add our own text there to replace the placeholder copy. So we've got one, two, and three. Let's make sure that is a bit closer to the number, just like the other ones. There we go, that's nice and tidy. What people say about us. Again, we use ChatGPT to do all this and we set this up in a mostly smart way. So we can change the content and it will update whilst keeping the design nice and consistent. And the design adheres to the responsive grid as well. So when this comes to making it mobile, we know we're all good. We're gonna work there as well. And then recent submissions that someone can scroll through. I think I'll just maybe move this a bit closer to this section. So it's clear that this relates to the carousel rather than this bit up here. And then down here, I'm just gonna push this bottom section. I've got a divider here, which is just a line at 15% opacity, just to kind of separate that footer from the content. And if I just scan down my design off camera, one thing I'm missing, some tags. So let's command click to select that and we'll <laughs> paste that, <laughs> paste a random circle. Don't know what happened there but let's select that copy and we'll just, we'll paste in some new text. And I've got some tags here. We'll go with cat, cool glasses, jacket, lightning. Lightning? No, lighting, there we go. Lighting, because it has got some pretty nice lighting. And I've got my lighter color here, six, six E seven, two, eight, one. So, got the username here and then a bit of uh, descriptive text with some tags for the currently selected image in the carousel. And I think for the most part, that is pretty much it. And now I'm going to animate these icons by introducing a hover state. So to start with, let's zoom in on the icons here and we're gonna, we're gonna give these a little bit of animation, which will be really nice. So I'm gonna start with this first one. Let's drag a copy of this out here for now. And then what I'm gonna do is create a component from this. And we can go and give this a name. Let's go with icon one. And then I can create a variation of this component. So there we go, I've added a variant. Let's just, let's extend this down and create a bit more space. There we go. And what I'm gonna do with this one is create an alternative state. So let's double click to go inside. I'm just gonna move this up. I think with the arrow, we could move this up as well, maybe just a little bit. And then these ones here on the side, I'm just gonna rotate those out. So they're kind of coming up and outwards, something like this, maybe move them up a bit more, something, something like that. And what I can do is actually select this bottom one and I'm gonna call this, let's call this hover. And then over here, we've got the default one. And if I switch over to prototype mode, I can look for this little plus sign here, drag this to the hover state. You can see it's selected. And then what I can do is set this to while hovering and change the animation to smart animate. And there's a few options here for the animation. Let's go with ease in and out so it's nice and smooth. 
And then if I just drag an instance of this, dragging, holding, alt or option onto the frame, and then we'll play this. Let's scroll down. And you can see it animates in and out. Okay, that's pretty good. So what I'm gonna do now is just get rid of that and then just carefully replace this. If I try and drag it here, you can see it applies it to that component. So what I'm gonna do is just move it up there and then nudge it in with the arrows. Cool, so we've done one. Let's move this to one side. Let's try and do this second one here. So I'm gonna drag a copy out here, create this as a component. Let's switch back to design and I'll call this one icon2 and we'll create a variant oops I just named that ZZ let's call that hover again so we're just gonna have a hover state zoom in nice and close now it doesn't really work if you just try and rotate this like this nothing happens so for something like a rotation what you need to do is double click to go inside and rotate the two shapes themselves so we're not rotating the variant, we're actually rotating the shapes inside the variant. And this one did cause me a few problems at first. So let's try this one and fingers crossed it works. So I've got to select that top one, go to prototype, and then look for that little plus sign there, drag this to that second variant. Again, while hovering, Smart Animate, it's got those same settings as before. And then let's drag an instance onto the frame and <laughs> fingers crossed it works. There you go, you can see it rotates around. That's pretty cool, I like that. Cool, okay, two down, one to go. Let's get that one in there as well. There we go, very nice. Let's move these out of the way. Okay, last one. We've got the wallet, this one's nice and simple. So we're going to create a component. I'll call this, of course, icon three. We're going to add a variant. I will need to increase this size just to give myself a bit more space to work with. And for this one, nice and simple, I'm just going to move the card up and just rotate it like this. And then I might move the wallet just down a little bit in the opposite direction. So we'll just grab these different shapes and we'll just nudge that down. So they kind of move in opposite directions. The card goes up, the wallet goes down. We'll see how that looks. So let's select the top one, switch to prototype, create a connection to this other variant, set that to on hover. We've already got smart animate there. Let's just drop it onto the frame just to check it works. Hey, there we go, it does. Three out of three, fantastic. Okay, let's just drag that into place. Maybe nudge it up a pinch. And there we go, we've got three icons that we very quickly animated. Let's scroll down. And as we hover over them, they do a little animation, which is really, really nice. Cool. Right, let's put these to one side. And now we're going to animate that carousel slider at the bottom. Next, we're gonna work on animating this carousel here. And this is a little bit more involved. There are some very advanced ways that you can do this in a way that's very efficient. But for this one, we're gonna keep it nice and simple. So first of all, what I'm gonna do, just to make this a little bit simpler, I'm just gonna limit the tags to three. You'll see why in a moment. And then what I'm gonna do is drag this over here, create a copy, and we'll add a few tags for this one. So we'll go um, sunny, house, and we'll go sky. There we go. Lovely sky. And what we're going to do is we're going to animate this carousel using the left and right arrows here. And this one will become nice and big. And then this cat, this really cool cat, will nudge on and become smaller. So how are we going to do this? Right, well, first of all, we're going to select the cat, cat bandit username, and the tags. And then we're going to click on auto layout. Now you can see it kind of stacks them like this, which uh, isn't ideal. So we're gonna left align these first. 
And actually, it stacked all of these up. So let's undo that a second. We're going to go back before I've uh, auto laid out this uh, group of objects. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually group the username and the tags together because that way they will sit alongside each other. So let's try and auto lay out this one again. And there we go. Now I can adjust the spacing, but it's kept these two in line and we're going to have that left aligned. And we'll do the same for this one. So we'll group the username and the tags together and then we'll make that an auto layout group. And then we'll do the same for the last one. We're not going to get as far as this, so we won't need to add the tags. But we'll group them together and then auto lay it out that one all the same. Okay, so what I'm going to do for this next bit is just select everything that I've got here. And I'm going to duplicate this outside of the frame. So I'm going to work on this over here. And what I'm going to do is actually get rid of the text and make this entire section here, all of it, a component. So let's create a component out of this. And we'll call this carousel. So that is our starting state. And then what I'm going to do is create a variant. And you can see it creates this underneath. And now what I need to do is shift this along one to the left. So let's double click to go inside. And again, so I've got just the cat bandit image. Let's make a note of this height here. We've got a decimal place there. So let's let's round that up. We'll go 667. Check the link as well. So let's make a note of that 667 on the height. And for this one here, these smaller images are 424. So what I'm going to do is select the cat one. We'll change the height to 424. And then this one that's next up, that is going to become 667. And you can see, so I forgot to link the width and height there. So click the link icon, 667, and there we go. It goes bigger. And because we set this up with an auto layout, you can see the tags and everything underneath. As I adjust the size, the tags do kind of move with it in the correct way. So now we've got to nudge this all along by one. So let's move this one over. We've got Cat Bandit as well. That one kind of moves all the way out. We've just got to line this one up here. And it's not showing any smart guides lining up between variants, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's fine. We can just do it manually. There we go. And then we've got this one here. Let's just check that lines up. Yep, that is good. Okay, brilliant. And then we've got this one over here that will nudge over. And I think they're 32 pixels apart. So there we go, that is our second state. And if you did have any other ones over here, they would kind of slide in from the right hand side. So we've created the two different states now. What we need to do is make the slider actually work. So let's double click to go inside and select this component here. And if I go to prototype, I can then look for that little plus and drag this to that variant. So there we go. On click, we're going to change to. And you can see it's filled out variant two. And you can, of course, name the variants if you like. We've got smart animate, ease in out. We've got a few other ones here as well that you can play around with. Bezier could be quite fun, but we'll leave it set to ease in and out for now. And then once it's gone to this variant here, we're going to do exactly the same, but in reverse. We're going to use the back arrow to go back to this one. And you can see it remembers those same settings, which is very helpful. And this is the moment of truth. We can just drag over all this. We'll, we'll put this to one side just in case something goes wrong. Remember, we'll keep the text there because that isn't actually part of this uh, component. So let's drag a copy onto the frame and we'll get that back in exactly the right position, something like that. And then if we go to play, scroll down, hopefully our carousel should work. And there you go, you can see that we can move backwards and forwards, the size changes, and you can do this again, you can add more variants if you like and um, just continuously scroll through multiple images.
And there we go, we've added some subtle animation to our design. And this is really just a great way to elevate your design and take it to the next level. And there we go, that wraps up the course. I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. As always, a massive thank you to Envato Tuts Plus for having me here on the channel. But that's it from me. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.